wanted to share with you that message because the message is related to the last generation of the Church of God. As you know, brethren, we have prophesied, we have prophesied, as you know, in the Bible there will be seven church eras, and indeed we do have seven church eras outlined in the Bible. Uh, we obviously have realized that we live now in the last one. This last one is the dominantly Laodicean era. Uh, I wanted to share with you some of the things that are very relevant about that era. And uh, because it can affect all of us, we certainly live in this dominantly lukewarm age. We see the lukewarmness and the indifference in all of our societies around the world where we live. And that can certainly affect us as well because it was not unusual throughout the history of God's church that uh, conditions in the world would affect the church of God and the people of God. Now, if you were new to the church and you were starting to really open up the Bible for the first time in your life, what would you consider, brethren, to be the strangest prophecy of all? Because, you know, we are all very concerned with Bible prophecy, aren't we? Particularly as we understand that we are living in the very end time. There are prophecies you remember, particularly if you are new to the truth, that strike you as very strange. For example, Ezekiel as a prophet lying 13 months on one side and 40 days on the other side. What about Hosea, when God tells him, go and, and marry harlot? You know, <laughs> Imagine God coming to you, God of Israel, and saying, go and marry harlot. Of course, all of those things had certain figures and uh, symbolical meanings, but nevertheless... Or, for example, if you would read the prophecies of Daniel, there is that Nebuchadnezzar's dream composed of different metals and perhaps different horses riding off in different directions in the book of Zechariah. Or the book of Revelation with locusts coming up out of a bottomless pit. Brethren, there are many prophecies that, on initial reading, when we are new in the Church of God, may strike us as very strange. But really, the strangest prophecy in the Bible relates not to strange actions of the prophets, nor to curious symbols used in the prophetic books. It doesn't relate to weird-looking creatures or to the trumpets of Revelation. In fact, brethren, the strangest prophecy in the Bible does not relate even to the future of the house of Israel. The strangest prophecy relates to the church of God itself, brethren. Before we get to that prophecy, let us remind it about three great advantages that we, as the members of the church of God, have in this end time. The first of those great three advantages is that we are a part of the greatest and most extensive work of God in scope of all of man's 6,000 years of history. And by our discussion now prior to this message, you could see how much we are reaching, how much we are serving, how much our outreach is. The statistics also show us an incredible outreach that God has granted to the hope of Israel in the last how many, three, four, five years. But, you know, we are excited by the growth that God gives to us and the doors he has opened to us. And this truly is not a dull work, you know, <laughs> especially with our recent experience and recent history. It is an exciting work to be a part of. That's the first great advantage of us being today, in this day and age, part of the Church of God. The second great advantage we have in the Church of God today, brethren, is that we have a greater understanding of the Bible than ever before. Even... You know, it's a greater understanding of the Bible prophecy simply because we we'll live at the end time of the fulfillment of many of the prophecies put into the Bible. In fact, many of the prophecies of the Bible could not be understood until our time. And so we are watching the prophecies of all the end times as they unfold before our very eyes. Let me just remind you, I'm not sure if your news media outlets have told you, but let me just remind you that this, this past week, this is be, which is behind us, there is a new block of nations called BRICS. A new block of nations with people, those are countries in development, developing countries who want their voice to be heard more in this world. But the BRICS is interesting, you know, because 40% of humanity is part of the BRICS, including South Africa. In fact, the... Uh, uh, the conference, this conference of BRICS was held in Johannesburg. And during that conference, you might have heard that India managed to land on the moon. So the Indian Prime Minister addressed 
his nation from Johannesburg because he was attending the BRICS summit, the BRICS conference. Now, the BRICS conference, 40 nations want to join it. 21 have already submitted their formal request. But brethren, do you know what is one of the main goals of BRICS? Is to quote, de-dollarization. They want to get rid of the of dollar as being the uh, means of international trade. They want to trade in their national currencies. Interesting, isn't it? Which means that the crash of dollar, brethren, is getting closer. It's getting closer, and uh, once it crashes, I'll just then have to give you the, 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 the topic of the day. What is now waiting for America? Brethren, we're going to see horrible things in America that we could not imagine. We could never have imagined that. There'll be mobs storming into the shopping malls, uh, Walmarts, storming into food chains. The food chain, the food supply will be completely messed up because... If you want to mess up America, all that you need to do is just to have the grid, have the grid off for at least an hour. If the power goes off, Americans don't know what to do. I remember several years ago, it was in San Francisco. The power went out for about half an hour. Metro did not work. And my word, there was a whole upheaval in the city. A huge demonstration and people being so desperate and crying, you know, because the metro didn't work and they didn't have electricity for about half an hour. The horrible things are waiting for America, brethren, outlined in the pivotal Old Testament prophecies for the house of Israel. It's Leviticus 26. Once the dollar crashes, I'll have to deliver Leviticus 26 to all this world as a witness because what will happen to America and Britain, but let's stay with America, what will happen to America is outlined in Leviticus 26. Now, the countries of the BRICS, it's already 40% of humanity because you have to keep in mind the BRICS members are South Africa, one of the greatest nations in the world. South Africa, Brazil, China, India, Russia. The latest member to be admitted was the greatest Arab nation, Egypt. It just intrigued me that uh, before joining the BRICS, Egypt was asked to revoke the recognition of the self-declared self -declared Republic of Kosovo, which is a southern Serbian province. And it's a particular story, but we will not cover it today. In any case, brethren, but interesting enough, the way uh, the, the, the same time that our Terry was on the way to Malawi, interesting enough, Malawi was visited by South African representatives. Now I wonder if Malawi might be one of those 40 countries that want to join BRICS. <laughs> I don't know why would that be interesting, but it would be interesting because that's the first country where we are, where we are registered. So, but the point is de-dollarization, brethren. The, the nations of the world, 40% of humanity is working on kicking dollar out of the international trade. So eventually dollar will only be kicked out because we know dollar has no value in true gold anymore. Dollar is being printed out like a paper, you know. And in the past, it was a very good way for America to also have a constant oil supply for from Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia and other countries, you know, who are oil producers, because you know, oh, 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 we need some, we need some more oil. Let's just print out some more dollars because the uh, dollar was secured currency used by Saudi Arabia and others for trading with oil. Right now, if you uh, uh, if you don't know, Saudi Arabia recently dropped or uh, dropped the dollar from its trade with China, uh, and so it's on the way. The 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 the, the, the debacle, the, the 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 total crash of dollar, brethren, is on its way. And then I don't know what will happen in America, but considering American mentality and considering the fact that Americans are not used to all kinds of hardships that the rest of us or some of us are used around the world we can see horrendous things happening in America. And perhaps it would be good that some of our members in America or elsewhere in Anglo-Saxon world perhaps leave their countries on, you know, before all that chaos ensues because we don't know what that chaos can be. Considering how much weapons is stored in the 
hands of private citizens of America, <laughs> it's a question if a civil war would not break out, and I wouldn't be surprised if it does. Horrendous things, brethren, in, in store for the Anglo-Saxon world. And that's why we need to follow the news. I told the Serbian congregation today, you cannot be dummies. It says, you know, Jesus Christ said, watch and pray. We have to watch the world events in order to understand what is the time in which we live. We have to watch the world events in order to know. And if your news would not, would not report you on certain things, don't worry. There is us in various parts of the world to tell you. To tell you things about the BRICS. To tell you things about uh, German, German activities. To tell you about Europeans. To tell you about you name it. But we have to watch and pray. Why, brethren? Remember, it says to be encountered worthy to things happening. So we have to watch and pray in order to. Uh, well, we don't have to watch TV necessarily. But anyway, there is a storm in, in Spain and it's weakening connection, internet connection. Well, we understand that, Alejandro. We had uh, various difficulties on the internet today in Serbia. And right here we can see that people around the world also have the same internet uh, problems. So we have to watch and pray. We have to watch and pray to be accounted worthy to escape all those horrible things happening, brethren. One of the problems with the Laodiceans is that they do not believe Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ says that the Great Tribulation will be the greatest horror ever to happen to human race. But it seems that the Laodiceans, being so comfortable in this life, And, uh, you know, they don't believe that. That means they don't believe the words of Jesus Christ because everywhere in the Gospels we do have we do have what? We do have everywhere in the Gospels Christ's words that the Great Tribulation will be the greatest ever. Something that will not happen again. And never happened in the past. But the Laodiceans don't seem to believe Jesus Christ, you know? They seem to be lulled into this comfortable life and completely oblivious to what Jesus Christ warns us about. I don't want you, I want, I want the hope of Israel to be a, a bunch of dummies, forgive me for using this word, a bunch of dummies that don't know what evil world in which we live, they don't know what's happening around the world, brethren. Especially not in this day of internet when you can basically tune into any ma basically radio around the world, if you wish. How were we able in Serbia to follow the coronation of King Charles III? <laughs> Thanks to internet, of course. So, brethren, we have no excuse. So, please, number one, don't be just in involved in your little life. It's important, of course, but also be involved, uh, be involved in some kind of let's call it, let's call it global watch. Watch and pray always, brethren. We cannot pray about what shall we pray if we don't know what's going on in the world. And I suspect that much of your media did not report to you that the countries of BRICS held a very successful conference this past week in Johannesburg in South Africa. And the first thing that they pointed out, they were just trying to, uh, they are, their goal is de-dollarization and using of the national currencies in the international trade, number one, which would hopefully boost the national economies. And number two, the second day, number two, they announced they are now ready to expand. There are rumors that there will be five countries to be admitted to the bloc. And, uh, but I told you, 40 countries want to be part of the bloc. So we are seeing before our own eyes, we are seeing the rise, possibly of Gog and Magog, because we are talking about countries in development, developing countries. We are talking about China and Russia. So, brethren, it's something important, very important. We all need to know about it. If your press did not tell you about it, well, here you hear it from here because the Serbian national national television <coughs> and news agency reported every day of the conference about the most important developments of that conference. BRICS, it's another power block brethren on rise. 
please be aware of that and of course the the, 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 the main or one of the main countries the most the, the most populous countries in the world are already there India China and Russia so it's a it's a block to be counted on it's a block that some nations that where you live might join which you know they say it would be a good thing because their, their mutual cooperation will lead to uh, strengthening of the national economies so be on alert but at the same time we're having another political block which could be counter counter uh, count which might counter United States of America of course because they want to destroy dollar but number one they can also be counter counter to the another block there which is called the European Union oh because don't you think that they're happy with do you think they'll be happy with German dominance over the world as much as they're not happy with American dominance of course not so keep that in mind, brethren. We need to we need to be watching the the, the, the 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 events. And in this day and age, when you can tune to basically any radio station around the world through to internet, you know we we are the only. Speaking of radio, we came back to radio, brethren. We are the only, as far as I know, the Church of God, only of all the churches of God that have our own radio. No, we're not going to waste precious money on 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 trying to hire, you know. Uh, spaces uh, in, in secular radios of this world or TV stations oh no of course not in this day and age brethren I think we can even produce our own video our own videos videos our own perhaps even TV channel that we can just post on social networks and use why should we be wasting our money on secular sources to preach the gospel no of course not and now, as you know, we do have already radio in three languages, in Spanish and English and in Serbian. Hopefully, we will just expand it into more languages as, as we are able to. But anyway, so the second advantage we have in this age, day and age, is the fact, brethren, that we can understand the prophecies like never before, and uh, we see those prophecies, in fact, unfolding before our own very eyes. The third and the greatest advantage of all that we are we are basically the generation that will see the return of Jesus Christ to this earth. For 2,000 years, brethren, God's people have prayed, Your kingdom come, in obedience to Jesus Christ's command to do so, but the kingdom never came. It came for those saints in the past, in one sense, at the time of their death, because they have no awareness of the passage of time. So the next moment, they will be in the first resurrection, that kingdom has come in answer to their prayers. But we understand that we are living in the generation that will literally see God's kingdom come. So these three, these are three advantages, great advantages that we have in the end time era of God's church. Yet, brethren, this brings us to the great paradox, the greatest paradox, perhaps, of the end time. And you may wonder, now, what is that great paradox? Well, we see it in this uh, message to Laodicea. Brethren, the paradox is that the closer we get to the return of Jesus Christ, the more some converted Christians are to become unexcited about that return. Now, on the surface, so many prophecies of the end time make sense, except this one. This is perhaps the strangest prophecy of all, this one, brethren, related, indeed, relating to the Church of God, that we who live in the end time with great advantages than any other preceding generation of Christians should allow ourselves, with the imminency of Jesus Christ's return, to become unexcited about it, lacking in our spiritual approach to life, and perhaps lose out on the great reward that is a few years down the road. Please turn with me to Revelation 3, beginning verse 14. Because what we understand concerning the seven eras of the church is that they were, of course, contemporaneous with each other. And so the problems related were all a part of the apostolic era, though the major problem with the apostolic era was that of the Ephesus church. As we come down through history, there is the flow of the different eras, and we realize that we are a part of, hopefully, or we want to be part, or we aspire to be a part of a Philadelphian remnant today, amidst the last Laodicean era of God's church. But as we would understand, 
There have always been Laodiceans in every area of the church. There was always a portion who had that particular lukewarm spirit and attitude. But what is made clear by the Bible is that these problems are not just contemporaneous. They also follow one another and one after the other from the standpoint of what is the biggest problem of that particular group in that particular century. So we are faced with a whole era of lukewarm Christians. And uh, I should probably say I'm just rectifying my error from several years ago when I, uh, when I delivered a message called Martyrdom of the Laodicean Churches. Sadly, I was misled, even though in some translations it says the, uh, to the churches of Laodicea, uh, it's a it's a wrong translation because in the original Greek it's in singular, not in plural, brethren. But you know the leader of the former my church former affiliation obviously believed that he is the only one, the only leader of the Philadelphian remnant, and that the Philadelphian remnant must be all in his church anyway and must join in his church ranks and whatever. So he basically posted he he basically spread around the world that the. Uh, it says in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, that it says uh, not in singular church, the Laodicean church, but it says the Laodicean churches. Brethren, no, it does not. In Serbian, it is in singular, but also in original Greek, it is in singular. One of our deacons here in Serbia who understands Greek also read to me all the uh, addresses to all the seven churches in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and chapter 3. And in every address, to every church, it is in singular. Church of Eph at Ephesus, Church of Thyatira, Church of Sardis, Church of Philadelphia. So it is the same in the, the Church of Laodicea. So it's one church. It may have perhaps, who knows how many local churches, and who knows how many Laodiceans in plural, but nevertheless it says, it's, uh, it says this is the address to the church at Laodicea in singular and brethren about three things I had to rectify ever since we became hope of Israel the first thing that I abolished was that if somebody keeps the Passover by himself or herself he could or she could just wash his or her own feet that's 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 totally ludicrous that's something that I don't recall that the Church of God ever taught but this this leader, who thought he is just appointed by God to change whatever and be the, 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 the main arbiter of who is Laodicea and who is Philadelphian, changed it. So I just, of course, re uh, annulled that because that's not part of what the Church of God ever taught. And plus, it doesn't make any sense if we know what washing of the feet means. By the way, I've published a book in Serbian about the New Testament Passover. Uh, because I wanted to present to my nation the, the, the pivotal truth of that and how that practice has been falsified by Eucharist and all of these modern day nominal Christian practices. But at the same time, I've got materials in English and perhaps we, I should put it together and have it as a booklet for us in English. Because washing your own feet, I mean, just does does it make any sense? It doesn't make sense to me. That was the first administrative decision I made before we, because we came together as a hope of Israel, sometimes around the Passover anyway. The second one was the several days ago when I realized that once I was told in that former affiliation that gambling, occasional gambling for relaxation and fun is okay for Christians. Now that doesn't make any sense, but you know it's not okay for Christians because it that just uh, it just uh, fans uh, wanting or greed for money without any work being performed. Uh, what is so relaxing about wasting God given the money God has allowed you to earn, wasting it on gambling and trying to earn money? without any work so I just abolished that and I said that the casinos are not the places for Christians casinos and any places with all kinds of vices are not places where Christians should spend their time or their money 
And here is the third rectification because, again, I falsely was duped to believe that it says Laodicean churches in, in uh, plural, but it does not, brethren. It does not. So we are faced here with a whole era of lukewarm Christians who are in one church, church of Laodicea. Yes, there have been Laodiceans throughout the history of God's church, but you know, here at the end time of all times, with the imminent return of Jesus Christ, we have an entire era of people that are lukewarm Christians, unexcited about the greatest event in man's history. Now truly, this is a strange prophecy when we live closer to the return of Jesus Christ, closer than ever before. What factors, you may ask, have produced an entire era of Laodicean Christians. Well, I've mentioned to you already the three, I've mentioned the uh, need to examine three reasons for the rejection of these people. The rejection of those three advantages. Three reasons why they don't take advantage of the advantages. The first one involves the prosperity of, of, of the end time. Please, if you're in Revelation chapter 3, please go to verse 14 again to the angel of the church of the Laodicea, right? These things, says Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning, or the beginner, as it should be, the beginner of the creation of God. Now, if you notice, Jesus Christ addresses each church with a different introduction. So this introduction is unique for the Laodiceans. He says, these things says the Amen. Now, brethren, the Amen is a word that can be, that means so be it. It can also mean, I believe, I agree. And yet, the Laodiceans, because Jesus Christ uses this particular introduction for a purpose, they don't truly believe Jesus Christ in a sense that their faith, to a certain extent, is a dead faith. It's not a living faith. You know, they, they pay lip service to Jesus Christ and to the commandments, but they don't really act like Jesus Christ in their lives. If they did, they would be Philadelphian. They would be zealous. Not that Philadelphia is the greatest of the churches by any means. Each one has those who will be in the first resurrection, each one of those eras. But just to simply contrast there, the faithful and the true witness, because Jesus Christ set an example and was a witness to the Laodiceans of how to live zealously for God. He was the beginner of the creation of God. There is a problem with the Laodiceans with intellectual vanity. There is no humility that recognizes God as their creator and look to him daily because they recognize daily their need, daily need for God. Instead of the approach, oh, I have a need of nothing. But also, brethren, there is another application of this. That namely, amen is the way we end something and this is the last era of God's church. The faithful and true witness because the Laodiceans who have truly, not truly done the work of God are going to have to do it in order to make it into the kingdom. One way or the other, if you don't do a work now, you will have to do a work then. God will not take non-workers into his kingdom. And so they will have to do a work of witness of God out of Philadelphia is taken to the place of safety. And they will recognize their God and their true need for him. Because in verse 17 he says, Because you say, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. In other words, oh, I am okay spiritually. I am doing fine. But obviously, brethren, there is the physical application of, as well as the spiritual. Because we live in the richest generation of all time. We live better than kings and queens of the past ages lived when they lived. How many of them had television? How many of them had refrigerators? How many of them had air conditioning? You know, living in some of those drafty old castles, they would certainly envy some of the luxuries we have today because we are a generation that is rich and is increased with goods. Not that riches are wrong or goods are wrong. They can be a blessing from God. Abraham was a wealthy individual, but he always kept it in perspective. God first, material things way down the line. Now, continuing in verse 17, And know not that you are wretched and miserable, poor, blind and naked. You know, and the major thrust of this 
of course, is spiritual. But certainly there is the physical application as well, brethren, that is not negated by the spiritual. They are both here. You know not. You know not, meaning they are deceived. You know, people can be deceived by the comforts of modern day living, the ease of this life in comparison to when you were grubbing the ground for food stuff in the past ages. If you notice also Matthew 13, beginning in verse 19, the parable of the sower and the seed, verse 19, Matthew 13, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it not, he or she is not truly in what called by God, then comes a wicked one, catches away that was sown in his heart, this is he that receives seed by the wayside. But he that receives the seed in, into stony places, the same as he that hears the words and not with joy receives it, you meaning Ben the curiosity seeker, you know, to a certain extent, yet he was not root in himself. In other words, he is not truly deeply committed he is just superficially interested he has no not root in himself and lasts only a little while when some tribulation or persecution arises because of the word immediately he is offended you know very thin he has no root there so it is very easy for him uh, to get offended verse 22 but he also that receives seed among the thorns is he that hears the word and the care of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. Which meant that he was bearing fruit for a while and then he became unfruitful. This is, brethren, a person in God's church. The Bible is written for God's people. And he speaks to the church, not to the world. And... Uh, What were the major causes, you know? The care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. Now the Laodiceans know not, meaning they are deceived. The deceitfulness of riches, the comfort of this present society has had its effect upon them, has made them too com complacent and lukewarm. They, are being, they have been lulled into a false sense of security. They think they are secure because they are in the church. Because they hear the sermons and the Bible studies. They are not truly aware of their spiritual condition. But then some of that spiritual condition is the result of the age in which we live. They don't have to beg God every day for their next meal. They have got enough stock you know, in the refrigerator there were times when Christians in past ages were truly praying, give us our daily bread, because a lot of times they didn't know where their next meal was coming from. Now, do we worry about that? We all know where the next meal is coming from. We bought it week, a week ago, or we can go out to a restaurant. It's very easy with the comforts of this society to get into a complacent attitude. If you go to Proverbs chapter 1, and uh, I'll like to conclude with that. In Proverbs chapter, Proverbs chapter 1, God is talking, we'll conclude for this time. I think this is a topic we will continue in the next Sabbaths, especially because the holidays are around the corner. The Day of Atonement is there. And of course, very exciting, the feast is fastly approaching, so... I hope we'll just spend this time and the whole Serbian congregation that we spend some time thinking about our relationship with God, thinking about our contribution to God's people, the contribution to God's work. The members here have already alerted me that during the feast they would love to hear uh, or found out some sermons that they thought or messages they thought would be very relevant and I'll try to deliver them during the feast in Serbian but I'll try to do it in English as well just for the sake of those of you who will be around, around the world. And again, I want to make sure that you know it's a policy of this group, of the Hope of Israel, that if there are people who are 
not against us but are with us regardless of what kind of church group they would belong that we should not be spending time and money on securing various feast sites we are you know god's church is a spiritual organism and we as god's people are there to be as we as god's people are there to serve god we as members of hope of israel to be light to the world and therefore wherever there are god's people who might be belonging to other church organizations that's okay if they're keeping the feast that's okay that's fulfilling god's commandment if they already have a site why should we bother about it we can just join them without any any fear there is no reason to fear god's people and all our ministers are also the ministers of jesus christ and they are commanded if you wish to be of service to every every and any anyone who is god's people so my policy would be my always stance would be the policy of the hope of israel would be everywhere we can join possibly other people of god we will because it's time i think it is really time to start preventing or stopping the the further fragmentation of the church of god the spiritual organism it's time to promote unity cooperation and brotherly kindness so uh, that will be our stance as far as the feast is feast does require great preparations great expenses we're a small organization we don't have all those sources there might be other people people of god who have them and we can just join them in the common service there is nothing wrong to do that if we're able to perhaps to organize our own feast site where other people can join that will be fine but if not not to worry brethren i hope that hope of israel will become the reference point the base if you wish for israel after flesh but also for the israelites after the spirit for spirit led israel whoever they are and human organizations are not important because human organizations are human organizations god placed all of us at baptism into the body of christ as he sees fit so why are we here to be why should we be obsessed with our church boundaries church organizations whatever I'm speaking about the true Christians, of course. So if there are true Christians around us who keep the holidays and stuff, or the feast, we can join them. There is no reason to fear our brethren. Yes, I know that the Church of Laodicea has got all these problems, but brethren, keep in mind, it's still God's church. Because remember, when Satan is, has fallen down, oh, woe down now to all of you inhabitants of the earth, for he has now with great wrath. Remember what he says, and then he says he came to uh, attack those to wage the war against the seed, the true spiritual seed of the church. And it says that he came down to kill and war with those who keep the testi who have the testimony of Christ and keep the commandments of God. Well, aren't those true Christians? I I would presume you all understand that they are. So even if there will be lukewarm Christians, whatever, if they're around here, they're still God's people, God's church. If they want to keep the feast, they have feast sites, we'll just join them. We're not going to be making our own, making something on our own just to be our own or just to show how mighty and great we are, the, how, the hope of Israel. No, we are not, brethren. No, we are not. If we are a Philadelphian remnant, then we'll have a Philadelphian uh, governance style, which we do. We will be filled with brotherly love, which so far I see is there. And we will also be keeping the commandments of God and have the testimony of Christ. There is as simple as that. There might be other, there are indications in the Bible, there will be four eras in the Great Tribulation. The Church of Thyatira, when Christ says, I'll throw that woman Jezebel and her children into the, into the Great Tribulation. Yes, there, there are still remnants of the, believe it or not, of the church from the Middle Ages, because Thyatira is the Middle Age church. There are still remnants of Valdensians around the world. Some of them are now Sunday keepers, a part of ecumenical movement. But you never know, 
perhaps some of them will repent or many of them will repent in the great tribulation if not before because they know what is their history the church of god international the church of god uh, seventh day is certainly present in not small numbers all over the world they have the commandments of god uh, and uh, they keep the sabbath but they just refused you know the holidays they refused the identity of israel church eras things that we had to start preaching because of their denials but there are still many of them around the world who is philadelphian remnant who is all philadelphia is up to god to judge we're not here arbiters who is law this year who is philadelphian we do strive and we want to be successor of what god did with philadelphian heir of god's church in the last century and we still hope and pray that we'll be part of that philadelphian remnant but we are understand, we understand that we live in a dominantly laodicean age when many people are so lukewarm when some people are even trying to convince me and you and others that the work of God was already done, preaching of the gospel was already done by Herbert Armstrong, now we all need to but just, I guess, sit back and uh, twiddle our thumbs and wait for the return of Jesus Christ. That makes no sense because Christ's words, Christ's instruction was, you know, uh, until the end of the age and I'll be with you till the end of the age. The end hasn't come yet. It's close, but it's not there yet. And also it says that the gospel of the kingdom of God will be practiced, and then Christ will come. Brethren, Mr. Armstrong did a great, tremendous work, which, which God allowed him to do in the last century. But uh, he did his part. We do have to do our part. With our radio, Hope of Israel, we have been reaching various nations that never reached really, were never really reached before. Through all the media that whatever all the Worldwide Church of God used, it was not reached. Our radio went all the way to Iceland, to Albania, to Romania, to all African countries, to Taiwan, to all countries of former Yugoslavia. To all the places where the gospel perhaps was never preached before. And we aim to be, we hope to be Philadelphian church. I hope that all of you would allow God to work in your life to change your characters. But we know we live in dominantly Laodicean era. It's, it's just as clear as anything else. And so, yeah, I, I, I mentioned Proverbs chapter 1. You know, God is talking about those who do not accept the way of wisdom. And he talks in verse 26 of the calamity to come. He says then in verse 27, When your fear comes as a desolation, your destruction comes as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, upon you, well, all those who have rejected the truth of God and the words of wisdom, that is, preached by this gospel message then in the tribulation they shall call upon me but i will not answer they shall seek me early and they shall not find me verse 22 for the turning away of the simple shall slay them now in some translate in some translation some bibles there is a, a margin saying the ease the easy way of life shall slay them the comforts of today, you might say, shall slay them. Does television reach out and grab a knife and stick it in you? Of course not. They can kill us spiritually because we can be so much at ease that we don't really push ourselves spiritually in prayer and Bible study before God. The ease of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But who so hearkens unto me will dwell safely and shall be quiet from the fear of evil to come. Now I realize for the most part these verses are dealing indeed with people in the world in contrast with those in God's church, but then also verse 32 can apply to the Laodiceans and verse 33 to the Philadelphians. Verse 32, 
33. Whoso hearkens unto me shall dwell in a place of safety. Now by extrapolation. And shall be quiet from the fear of the evil of the human conflicts during the great tribulation and the day of the Lord. But you know if a person has a Laodicean attitude then the ease of the simple shall slay them in the tribulation as Laodiceans and their prosperity shall have destroyed them. So this is the first reason that Laodiceans reject these three great advantages that's the prosperity of the end time. The second reason is that I'll continue next Sabbath it is evil of the end time because you know there as in Matthew 24 Jesus Christ had something to say about this end time generation and because of the wickedness that it, it is that is upon it. So again the Laodiceans reject three great advantages of our time being part of the church. If there are those of you who are kind of wavering and thinking about perhaps those of you who are not baptized yet well you have to realize God is calling you and he has revealed to you certain things that he did not reveal to the rest of humanity there must be a reason baptism brethren is not a suggestion it is a commandment and there is a reason why God called you and he opened up the uh, tree of the tree of 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 of, uh, of uh, life the tree that was the representation of the holy spirit the tree which adam and eve did not take but he opened it up to you there is a reason for that think always about that and kick out fear out of your lives so we'll continue with the Laodiceans in the next Sabbath and it will probably take us some time to finish the matter but uh, it is important in this end time to be constantly aware of God's providence, of God's commandments, of Jesus Christ, of what their true doctrine is. So we'll continue our teaching and uh, examination of the Laodiceans.